Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Finding Joy at Work webinar hosted by the Dupree Center. I am Michaela O'Donnell Long. I'm the Senior Director at the Dupree Center. And if the Dupree Center is new to you, you're like, my friend sent me this link. I just um, found my way in here. Let me briefly tell you who we are and what we do. Uh, we, we are part of Fuller Seminary, and we really exist to help leaders um, respond faithfully to God's calling throughout the many seasons of their life. Uh, we talk a lot about doing this through leadership, often in the context of work. Um, and in this, uh, over this last year, we've, um, we've taken on all kinds of topics in these webinars. And, we, and you can even find those online with videos to those. And when we ask people like, what is it that you, that you want to hear more about? What is it that you, we can help you with? So many people are telling us like, okay, the world is a whole lot right now, right? Even, even in the last 10 days, like, you know, from the um, racist hate crimes in Atlanta to the shootings in Boulder to even, even with some sort of hope on the horizon, like the tolls from COVID are really intense and it's really disrupted every industry um, in, in many different ways. And people are like, I just need like some space. I need some hope. I need some help. Um, and so those are the kind of webinars we've been doing, been bringing in different practitioners and experts to, to help us um, deal with what's going on, uh, which is why I am so excited today to have Angela Williams Gorell with us. Angela, come on, come on in, come on on the, on the screen. Angela is uh, a professor of practical theology at uh, Baylor's Truett Seminary. She is an ordained minister in the Mennonite Church USA. She's an author. She, her first book was on, it's called Always On, and it's all about, um, you know, spiritual uh, formation in a new media landscape. And then she has a, a very recent book, and, uh, is, which is going to be the basis for much of our discussion today. And her recent book is called The Gravity of Joy. And it, it really, if I, could, if I could try to put words, even, at least my own experience with it, um, it's a story of like her search for what does it mean to have authentic Christian joy in the midst of all that's going on in the world and her world. Um, so Angela, um, welcome. I, I wanna just sort of kick us off with a question in a minute, but even before I do that, I would like to invite um, you all, as you have questions along the way, um, and we don't necessarily need to save them just for the end. I've got plenty of questions and I can talk Angela's ear off and um, we, are, we are also old friends, which makes this a really um, very special moment for me. Uh, so I've got lots of questions, but we wanna hear your questions too. So all along the way, whenever you have them, go ahead and drop them in the Q&A. And the Q&A is a little bit different than the chat. We're gonna use the chat um, usually for when we have a question for you that we'd like you to answer. So if we want you to answer a question, we want you to put those answers in the chat. If you'd like to ask Angela a question, we'd love for you to put those questions in the Q&A, okay? So, um, <clears throat> Angela, uh, I think what I would like to start, what I would like for you know, people to know is like, why you? Why, you? why are you the lady that's out there talking about joy? Um, why, um, in a sense, like, why should we listen to you? Like, what's your story? So just kind of help wind us up and um, give us some of that context. Well, first I wanna say thank you so much to the Debris Center and to you, uh, Michaela, Dr. Long, thank you so much for having me, or Dr. O'Donnell Long, um, thank you for having me um, here today. And thanks to all of you who are joining us. Um, I hope wherever you are that you have some tea or coffee or yummy food that you are using, you know, also eating with us, like, you know, and hanging out, just we're, we're glad, we're glad to have you. And I'm really grateful to be able to talk to you all about something that's so needed right now in our, like, basically everyone's lives, which is joy. Uh, basically, we, should, we could all use some joy, could we not? Okay, so today we're going to talk a little bit about how do we posture ourselves for joy? How do we get ready for joy? But um, yeah, why me? Because, um, first of all, I... So it's why me is because of the story that I've lived. But um, so I'll start with uh, in March of 2016, I was hired to be a researcher at Yale and my job was to research and to study joy. Um, but that's not why I think you should listen to me, <laughs> um, especially in this moment in time, because um, certainly it was a very exciting time in my life. Michaela, you know about this time very clearly, you know, there's a lot of discernment going on, but I really felt, wow, what an incredible 
gift, what an incredible gift from God to be able to go to Yale and to research joy. And for the first few months that I was there, I read everything that I could get my hands on about joy, like every article, every book. I was just over the moon ecstatic to be doing this work, felt really um, basically like I found this unicorn position, you know, post PhD. And I'm just like, oh my goodness, I get to take a deep, you know, a breath of fresh air after five years of PhD work. And then eight months into working on the Joy Project, one Sunday, uh, on a Sunday morning, one week before Christmas, I got word that one of my family members, Dustin, died by suicide at 30 years old. I was in a church parking lot, strangely enough, when I got the text, because my mom had called me seven times to tell me, um, and I wasn't answering because I was singing Christmas carols with the youth group. <laughs> And um, I, I dropped my phone on the pavement of that parking lot and cried harder than I don't like that. I think that I've like ever cried in my life so quickly, so viscerally, you know, it was just this gut reaction of just like, it was nauseating. Um, so it's immediate. Um, and over the next week, I experienced multiple things that were just really, really difficult back to back. And I just found myself crying constantly. And I remember, you know, and we got through his funeral, we got through Christmas, which was just like, not Christmas. And I got back to New Haven, Connecticut, where I lived when I was working at Yale, that's where it is. And I just remember thinking, how will our family ever recover from this? And a week and a half later, ish my sister my younger sister called me to tell me that my nephew had suddenly died at 22 years old of a previously unknown heart condition and i found myself on a plane going to albuquerque new mexico to be with my older sisters my younger sister came there too and i found myself sitting around steph's counter trying to make sense of a senseless young person's death and i remember thinking, how will our family recover from this? Like, we'll never be the same. And we're not. Um, and I spoke at my nephew's funeral, did his obituary. I spoke at Dustin's funeral as well. Um, got back on a Sunday night from my nephew's funeral. And on Tuesday night, I got word two days later that my dad was in the ER fighting for his life. And I found myself five days, six days after my nephew's funeral at my dad's hospital bedside. Um, and I spent the last five hours of his life with him. And then I did his funeral a few days later. Um, so in four weeks, I lost three people that I love in really, and my dad, my dad died after 12 years of opioid use. So I get back to New Haven, Connecticut, and it's my job to study joy in the midst of just profound, profound grief. And this book, The Gravity of Joy, and this conversation today is about how in the world is it possible to be open to joy? How in the world is it possible to experience joy in the midst of suffering and in the midst of sorrow? Angela, I, um, I know that story really well and um, yet like hearing it uh it sort of like takes my breath away um it, it's hard to it's hard to imagine so much loss in such a short period of time um and you know it's a particular kind of loss and even in the book i mean y'all i'm not kidding the very first time i read the book angela sends me like early copies of it and i got little kids and you know i'm like doing different things and started i was like scanned it to see like okay like what's she doing here and i like couldn't put it down i was like oh oh my goodness and the reason i couldn't put it down is because like you you really do speak with a lot of vividness um about that like about all that happened and but yet it also doesn't feel like a story just about you, right? Like, it's like, okay, we, there's like, we all have actually, there's a lot of loss in the world right now. There's a lot of pain. There's a lot of suffering. Um, and yet somehow they're connected to joy. And so like, I'm wondering if even just this setting this in the context of both you, but also just everybody in a sense, help us start to make some of those links. Okay. Between suffering and joy. Like, what did you notice? 
What did you learn? Um, what even did you feel like God was asking you to pay attention to? Help us start to even just get a little more specific about those links. Yeah, so um, I'll start with sorrow and just say that um, it was interesting to me. Um, there was a, a particular morning that was very powerful for me. Um, and this was probably a year and several months after my dad's death. I think it's very important for people to know that it's not like I woke up, you know, a few weeks after my dad's death and, you know, wrote about joy, <laughs> that actually it was a good year and five months before I ever even could begin to really um, do my work in a way that felt like I, I mean, basically what I was doing was just like running the project and I stopped writing about joy myself. And we had lots of other scholars that were writing about joy and I read their papers for my job and stuff like that. But I didn't really start to, I mean, cause for me, it was like study joy. This is absurd. Like this is laughable. Like, no, you know, not, so it really wasn't about my life until a, a year and a half later. And there was a particular morning in 2018, a year and however many months later, where I'm reading in Ezra three with my teammates, we, we all like did this on, 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 you know, in the mornings we would have prayer time together and we read the Bible. And in Ezra three, it talks about the temple being rebuilt. And there are people that are looking on at the temple being rebuilt and they are rejoicing because they're so excited and so grateful that it's being rebuilt. There are also, Ezra says, people who are weeping because they remember that the, the way that the things used to be. And he said, it's, it's, it's hard to distinguish the sounds of rejoicing from the sounds of weeping. Mm. And I actually feel like in this sort of moment that we find ourselves in, like where we're seeing some light at the end of this pandemic tunnel and more and more people are getting vaccinated and, you know, more and more people are getting to actually see their, you know, especially like people who um, are older adults that they haven't been able to see for a long time, grandparents and grandchildren, all these things. I think we're, we're, you know, we're sensing some of that rejoicing over that, but at the same time, for so many people, there's just this last year has meant losing so much. Like we have lost so much, whether it's, you know, jobs or it's, you know, that time with family and friends, um, particular rituals and traditions that we're so used to engaging in. Um, but then in, in the last couple of weeks, like this return of violence that you were talking about and, you know, and just very much uh, embodied racism, you know, it's like, so this idea of rejoicing and weeping being together, I realized mm. joy can accompany sorrow. It's not dependent on sorrow, but it can accompany in it. It can accompany it. And I saw it in my own life. I began to realize, oh, wow, like joy can still make its way to me. And the reason why for me is that joy is the very being and presence of God like ministering to us. And so because joy is the very being and presence of God, and it's what it feels like to be ministered to by God, joy can always, always find you. Always. Even in the midst of sorrow. And even in the midst of suffering. I feel, so then I'll move to suffering. I think in suffering, we are especially longing for the good. We are longing for something. Um, we are longing for connection with others. We are longing for goodness. We're longing for meaning. And so when we sense that, even if for a moment, when we recognize, oh, goodness, when we recognize meaning, when we recognize beauty or, a, or like a, a connection with someone else, it can fill us up so much. And like that, that's the feeling, the, the joy is the feeling that follows, feeling like that sort of recognition and connection with other people, uh, with meaning, with truth, with beauty, with goodness. And so when we feel that in the midst of suffering, it can like that, that it, it's especially, um, I think, incredible. Like there's sort of, it, it's like we, we give ourselves over to a joy that's like really, really deep and profound because we're longing for that goodness, like so much, you know? And then finally, I'll say that I, um, that I think it's very important for people to realize that, um, there are different, so there's like the feeling of joy, which is what I just described, which is a gift. We can't make joy, the, the emotion or the feeling, but there's also, joy in the sense of like rejoicing as a choice. So we can't choose 
to feel the emotion of joy. We can't manufacture it, but we can choose to rejoice. And my friend, Dr. Willie James Jennings says that joy is a work of resistance against despair. Hmm. And that is for me at the heart of the gravity of joy of this book is helping people to realize that joy is a counter agent to despair. And that's why it's not a trivial, shallow emotion. That's the, why it's not just like, ooh, we're having a conversation about joy today. It's literally, it saves lives. Like joy rescues us from despair. Um, I, okay, so I have so many questions based on that, but I, I, a perfect segue, um, Jessica, uh, Jessica, good to see you and good to have this question from you. Um, I think it's, a, uh, it's just going to pick up right where you left off. Um, you know, Jessica emphasizes, um, you know, for your experience and, and has respect for your work. And then she says this, like, as a chaplain and therapist, I often find myself confronting shallow concepts of hope and positivity. Some refer to this as toxic positivity and the need to journey with people through the journey of pain, disappointment, in order that we, they, can experience a deeper sense of peace and joy. Um, so how do you, you start, you're starting to go there already, but how do you untangle the shallow sense of happiness or even toxic positivity, which can be confused with joy? Yeah, so on the, like, first of all, I wanna say that just happiness and joy for me are very different things. Um, and I don't think, I don't have a problem with happiness. I think it's great when you feel happy, but I think that happiness tends to be the feeling that we get when we assess our circumstances, the conditions of our lives, especially as it relates to resources. Um, and we look around and we think, okay, I'm happy. Like I have enough money. I have a shelter over my head. I like this food that I'm eating. Like this makes me happy. I enjoy, you know what I mean? Whereas um, joy is circumstance agnostic. Joy can be felt in the midst of incredible, amazing circumstances. It can be felt in the midst of horrible times and tragedies in our lives. So joy does not, it's not about an assessment of our circumstances or conditions. For me, that makes joy less shallow than happiness. I mean, it makes it, it's, more, it's a more profound emotion you know, um, than happiness for that reason. Um, and like I said, like, I have no problem with people like being happy, you know, but I think that when joy is, because joy is not tied to particular circumstances or conditions, um, then, and like, then we, when we invite people it to be like postured or ready for joy, we're not saying we're asking you to look around at your life circumstances, especially when they're terrible and to still be like, oh, but I feel really good. You know what I mean? No, like what we're, what I'm saying is that opening yourself up to joy is, is absolutely not looking at your life and just saying that it's great when it's not opening yourself up to joy is truly being someone who's looking for meaning, for truth, for goodness, who like is like, you know, and, and who is trying their best to connect with other people in real honest ways, you know? And so joy begins to look more like authenticity. It, it begins, you know, it, it begins to look more like um, I'm leaning, I'm open, you know, and so, and it's, so it's, and, and, and also though, as a gift, it becomes a thing like, so it's, it's, a, it, it's reciprocity. So it's a both end. There is a passive sort of sense of joy and an active sense. The active like aspect of joy is that you, it is an invitation to live with like open hands, like, okay, joy, I am assuming that you can find me because you are God, like, because it is God's presence ministering to me, like, I am open to joy finding me. At the same time, like, you know, and so there's, that's the leaning in, that's the active part. At the same time, I think that like the reason why that this is so like so much better than like toxic positivity is that joy is this gift. And so like, you know, it's about really like allowing this gift to come to you and not so much a work on your part of trying to pretend like things are okay when they're not, you know? Yeah, in a, in a bunch of different ways, I hear you saying, I think I hear you saying that, you know, we don't like, I don't even know if we get ourselves to joy, but that we posture and we receive joy and that joy um, comes to find us, but that we are findable, right? Like that we are like, uh, we're findable. Mm -hmm. um, and I, 
I'm, I, I, I just want to tease that out a bit more because I feel like, okay, how do we become findable, even and especially in the midst of all these things? Of course, you know, God, our, our faith tells us God knows where we're at. God, God's going to come for us. And, you know, God sees us in these little mini details and then as this big collective being, but like, you know, making that a bit more practical. I'm thinking actually, Angela, about like, some of your teachers along the way, maybe um, unexpected teachers. Um, and I'm thinking particularly about the women in the prison. Mm -hmm. And I am wondering if you can help us understand like how they helped you posture yourself for joy. And then like a part two of that is like, how do we start to look for teachers without putting that work on other people? Um, so can you, can you tell us a bit about, about them? Yeah, it's really critical for people to know that basically the way that I got on the road to healing and I stopped like living simply in the fog of grief was becoming a chaplain at a women's maximum security prison. And I was assigned the building with women on suicide watch. And also um, the majority of women who came to Bible study on Wednesday nights um, were in prison for something related to heroin or crack um, or both. You know, and so these were women that I realized, first of all, that they could be my teachers about understanding more of like Dustin and my dad's pain that contributed to their suicide and then um, my dad's addiction, um, you know, to Dustin's suicide. Like, so, because that's the thing is that I, I began to realize, oh, you know, um, suicide and addiction are largely related to wanting relief from pain. And when we realized that, we realized that um, that to heal suicidal thinking, to heal addiction, is to need to heal from pain <laughs> that we have that we're trying to escape from in our lives. Um, and so these women first began to help me see that. But then what I realized was that this Bible study became a space of joy. And I think that that's one of the things that we can do to become like very practically like open to it is to actually nurture spaces where joy is, uh, where we have permission to feel deeply and openly. And what that meant for us, like gate, like lament is a gateway to joy. Working through, uh, like constructively working through our anger and our fear. These are ways that we began to open ourselves to joy in practical ways as well. And that's also, that goes back to this person's question before, right, too, is that in order to posture ourselves for joy, we are doing things like engaging in lament. We are honestly facing our anger and our fear um, because those can be obstacles to joy. But if we constructively work through them, they, they can begin to open us up. And then as we do this, especially in community with other people, and we say in this space, which is what happened in this Bible study, in this room, you can be whatever you are feeling. You can bring any story here. And that's what somebody asked me recently, what was it about that space that was so powerful? And here is what it was. There was no shame in that room. There was no shame. If you could not read something, if you couldn't, if you were singing off pitch, you know, if you couldn't read because, you know, you, you went to school, but like it didn't, you know, you, you were never really taught to read well. And a lot of the women like really struggled with reading and writing. But if some people were struggling, other people jumped in to help you. If you sang off pitch, no one cared. If you started crying and you, you know, needed to tell this story that was really hard from when you were like young, no, everyone embraced you. There was no shame in the room. And that's another way of creating space for joy. Because when we feel no shame, we feel more deeply connected with other people. As we express these kinds of like all different sorts of emotions, as we befriend our emotions and allow them to become our teacher, like that's another thing, we can allow our, our, our emotions, our teachers, you know? And so um, I think for us, there was something about music, about storytelling, about befriending, like every emotion, about no shame that made that place a place of joy. Mm. I mean, I have to be honest, when I hear you describe that at the end, I'm like, well, that's like the best version of church, right? Like <laughs> music, I mean, ideally, right? And so I'm like, oh, that's interesting to think about that as, uh, you know, a place of no shame. Um, I, I think that in there, uh, there's, there's a good question about like the work, the work it takes to get here. Um, and I think you're getting into it, but it, I want to, I want to take that and then transition just slightly. So, um, 
you're describing like embracing feelings. You're describing doing the work of lament. You're describing honesty in the face of anger and fear. So you're actually describing this um, embrace of pain and potentially negativity as a way to posture for joy because it's a very full hearted thing. Um, and then I'm struck by, okay, I'm thinking now about so many of the people we serve, like our leaders working in different work contexts. And I'm like, okay, like, where does this stuff happen? Like, where does it happen exclusively at church? Does it happen exclusively in friend groups? Does it happen exclusively in Bible studies? Is there, have you seen, or, or even just your thoughts on the work of um, leaders in creating the kind of space that is, that does what you're talking about while not unhelpfully exposing people? There's, there's something really in there. Um, so my question is like, how, how can leaders, both in themselves and then in the people who are entrusted to their care, start to set up this kind of space? Yeah, I mean, I think that, first of all, um, the kind of space that you're looking for, I mean, to, to have the kind of experience that I'm talking about has to be very participatory. Mm. Everyone needs to know, like, your voice matters in this space. Like, we want to hear from you. We want to know your stories. We want, you know... Um, like this space cannot be what it is without you bringing your whole self here. So all of who you are is welcome here. And I, I, and I think it takes leaders who do it in a very intentional way. I mean, when I start my classes every semester, I literally have my students stand up and then I quote Thomas Groom, who says in his book, Educating for Life, that to educate is to stand on holy ground, people's lives. And then while they're standing, I say to them, we are on holy ground. And your life matters to me. And all of who you are is welcome here. You come here not as blank slates. I recognize you come here with histories, with cultures, with traditions, with stories that you have lived. And all of it is welcome here. Your questions, your hopes, your fears, your confusion, your longings are welcome in this space. And I think it takes leaders who, who do that in whatever way that that looks like for you and for whatever context, but where you're saying on a regular basis to people, like your story is welcome here and who you are is welcome here. And we want you to actively participate in this space. Um, and then I think it takes leaders, like the space itself teaches. So how we set up a space says whether we want people to participate or not. How we set up a space says where the power is. <laughs> how we, you know, so how we teach teaches, how we lead, lead, you know, teaches about leadership, how the space is set up says who can lead in this place and who can't, you know. And the more that I think we're inviting that active participation, I think the more the space becomes free for people to engage and everything that I think storytelling is a very powerful way of creating spaces of joy as well. Um, I think it's very important to recall to mind. So for example, I talk in the, in throughout the gravity of joy, I mention different like kinds of joy. There's sobering joy, joy as a bright sorrow. There's redemptive joy, um, healing joy. Um, there's a, a part in the book where I talk about backward looking or retrospective joy. Our brains are very, very good at remembering terrible things that happened to us because our amygdala was created to protect us, right? So it's important. Our brain will, will help us to remember negative experiences. We have to work very hard to remember joyful experiences that have happened to us. Um, and, but when we do, like we can, we can actually, I think as leaders, we can invite people to tell stories about times that they have experienced joy. And as they like, you know, you give them a few minutes of silence to think about it and then recall it to mind, meditate on it and then share stories with each other. That in itself can be an act of like welcoming joy because as you share your story, it reminds me, oh yeah, of like, I had a similar experience like that. I know what it's like to watch my child laugh and just be totally overwhelmed with joy like at this child that God has given me, you know, or I know what it's like to be doing my work and to have a moment when I realize, oh my goodness, what I'm doing right this second, this matters to me or it matters to someone else. And that feels so incredible that I get to be a part of this thing. 
you know, or whatever it is. And so as leaders, I think that's another thing that we can do is invite people like tell, let's, let's share our stories of times when we've experienced joy, especially joy at work. Like, I think it, it, it's a really incredible practice for leaders to think about of organizations every once in a while, helping people, like bringing people together and saying, let's talk about joy at work. When have you experienced joy in the workplace? When have you had a moment when you realized that what you were doing at work was bringing you joy and why? And then as you share those experiences with each other, you know, we, we can, you might have a question now. So I'll just, I have been talking for a little bit, but. <laughs> Oh, I love it. You're just helping me think very practically because uh, because I think what you're talking about here now is we shift from I think it's like, okay, it's one thing to talk about posturing ourselves for joy. It's, it's another thing to talk about posturing our teams and our people and the people entrusted to our care for joy, especially when you say so much of the posturing for joy involves facing pain, because that is uh, countercultural to many systems of efficiency in at least modern American life and work and business and industry. And um, uh, some, one, one person actually said, uh, and I think uh, I wanna ask this question and then I'll have another question. She said that one of the most difficult, she's a spiritual director, one of the most difficult parts of her work with some people um, is to help them find comfort in silence where they can really hear God's voice with no fear of rejection. And I think part of what I hear you saying is that that kind of stuff at least in explicitly Christian situations, may in some ways also be the work of a leader? Yeah, I think so. Yes. I think that it's, you know, um, I, I think that it's very important for us to realize that even if you don't, even if you work in an organization where the aim is not spiritual, like formation or something like that, that the spiritual health of your people on your team contributes to the mental and emotional health of your team members. <laughs> um, and the mental and emotional and spiritual health of your team members contributes to the vocational health, the organizational health of your institution, right? So I, I think it's important to see that actually part of our work of helping people to be like productive team members is actually caring for their spiritual, mental, and emotional health. I think it's important for leaders to see that. And like, you know, so a lot of my work right now in, um, you know, is related to being a contractor for uh, chaplains in the military. And so I've been going to different military bases and helping chaplains to help, to learn how to help soldiers to articulate and examine like meaning and purpose as a way of reducing suicide and addiction but also as a way of like creating just like healthier soldiers period. And it's been like part of my work is helping people like high, higher ups in the military to realize that the spiritual, mental and emotional health of a soldier directly impacts their ability to do their job, you know? And so, um, yeah, like when it comes to whether it's silence or it's storytelling, it's lament, it is every like emotion is like, like, you know, you're, you're like who you are is welcome here, all these sorts of things. Um, yeah, I, I, for example, Father Greg Boyle, I think there at home in, in Los Angeles, where you are at Homeboy Industries, they, he starts his day with like a meditation, with liturgy, I think with silence and with prayer, with like everybody in his company. That's, that's how they start their day. Um, and it's like hundreds of employees, you know what I mean? And there's something about that sort of grounding and, you know, that is so critical to the work of people that, um, you know, and I think he finds that, um, yeah, I mean, that when you're trying to, especially like to help people recover from the things that they, they've been re recovering for, that that's like very essential to the work, um, you know, is, is actually starting your day like that, starting with connecting with each, I mean, that's the same thing at Yale. We, you know, we were very busy people. We were working 80 hours a week with 70 hours a week sometimes. It was crazy, depending on the conference or this or that. But taking that time out in the morning to sit with each other, to ask, like, how are you, to check in, to pray over each other and to read together was very, very important and critical. It wasn't, it wasn't the thing that prepared us simply for the work. It was the thing that, like, helped us do the work. Yeah, formed you in, in many ways. And uh, to use your word posture, I just, 
I'm really struck by this because I think that this is, uh, and I love your example of working with the army because, you know, not everybody on, on this that's going to watch this is leading in an explicitly Christian organization. I mean, and there, but there's ways to invite conversations around, you know, meaning and purpose uh, because yeah, the spiritual, um, there's a lot of data on that, that the spiritual, emotional, and mental well health of people is giantly huge just on a human level and then on a productivity level. And most of us have probably seen the stats that like in, ranging depending on the year and COVID, uh, I can only imagine it's like 60 to 80% of people at any given time are like unhappy with their work. Mm-hmm. And so this like, you know, encouragement that actually, and I'm struck by what you said earlier in the conversation, it's like, you know, it's not just like you can be joyful in the midst of tough stuff too. So it's the encouragement to look for that. Um, so thank you for that. And I, you know, the, and there's more good questions coming in. Keep asking your questions. I'm loving the questions here. Um, this person says, I just ordered your book on Amazon. So that's cool and great. Um, and they're curious to know like what you learned about joy from the Bible um, and um, asking as, you know, this, they're sort of starting a, a Bible study on that. And you talked a little bit about Ezra, which I think is really helpful, but I know you have a, a pretty sophisticated um, uh, thoughts about this. So help us link even the big arc or individual stories of the Bible to your work. Yeah. So thank you so much for that question and for ordering the book. I really appreciate it. That's very kind uh, your support. And, and I would love to know your thoughts. So find me on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter, whatever, and let me know your thoughts after you read it. Um, and I'm at Angela Gurrell, Twitter at Angela Gurrell, Instagram, and then Angela Gurrell, like very easy to find two R's and two L's on Facebook as well. So friend me, um, I'll friend you, that'll be great. Um, you can follow each other. So um, there is so much to be said about joy in the Bible. And actually the Bible talks about joy far more than it ever talks about happiness. Though sometimes uh, particular translations can like, you know, translate joy, uh, as happiness, but it's terrible. So anyways, mostly the Bible is really about joy. Um, and a couple, I've learned so much that it would be hard to cover it all right now, but I will say just a little, um, I do have on my website for free, a discussion story and activity guide that goes with the gravity of joy. So um, a lot of people were saying to me, hey, we want to do a book club about this. We want to do a small group about this or whatever Um, in that. um, And so like I said, it's totally for free. You don't even have to give me your email for it. You just go to my website and click it and get the PDF. And basically every chapter has questions that you can talk together about like um, and then it has story prompts. Tell about a time when you experienced righteous anger this and that, the whole point, um, and then activities that are gateways to joy, um, ways of posturing, opening ourselves to joy. And so, um, and then there's a little section there, if the group that you're meeting with is Christian and would like to read the Bible together as well as part of this journey, there's, hey, with chapter one, read like First Kings 19 about Elijah being in the cave and then the Lord passing by, you know, uh, Psalm 77 for another chapter, this and that, you know, so I actually do link particular biblical passages to different chapters of the gravity of joy in that, in that guide for, for groups that want to meet, you know, but, um, so I will say two things other than that, which is one that, um, calls to rejoice in the Bible or to be joyful in the Bible are calls to y'all. They're not like in, in general, especially in the old Testament, it's like y'all rejoice. And that's a very important thing is that it's not like you, Michaela rejoice, um, that it's really, it's to a group, it's to a community. And I think that's important because one, um, not all of us has like the characteristic of joyfulness, but like some people that's like a gift. I feel like that God has given them. It's like, they kind of just like, it's not me. I'm a theologian. So of course, like joyfulness is not like my chief characteristic. Um, but there are those people who are just like joyful, you know, and then also, you know, God created us with different brains, different, and we have different life experiences. And like, especially given what we're like, given what we go through at any different times in our lives, our capacity for joy can be like our threshold can be like higher or lower. Um, so I'm encouraged by the fact that, you know, and then joy is contagious and it's infectious. So it makes sense 
that like one other, like somebody's joy can be, become my joy and we can share it. Even if like the thing they're rejoicing over wasn't my thing, I can still like, you know, so I'm really encouraged by that. Calls to rejoice are calls to the community in the Bible. The second thing that I noticed that's really important to me to say today is that um, Luke 15 might be like the joy chapter in the Bible. Um, because it's the store and, and then, and well, and really the gospel of Luke is about joy. Like it is about how Jesus is coming and he's going to be, bring great joy. And then you end with like, these women are so joyful after they have realized that Jesus has like been resurrected. Right. So this is the gospel. The gospel of joy is Luke. And then Luke 15 though, is this very, very powerful, um, basically ode to joy and it's about loss. It's the story of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son, the prodigal son. And so this whole chapter is about joy, and yet it's also about loss. And I think for me that that's, that was, that's something that helped me. So for, for me, Luke 15 is dedicated to redemptive, restorative joy. Hmm. I maybe providentially I read Luke 15 um, just yesterday morning uh, and I was I wasn't think I don't know if I have the joy lens like you do uh, but I certainly was thinking of this like lost and found and this just like um, how much uh, being found uh, means and, and that God's delight in us that was really helpful and beautiful um, and I love Melody added in that like it reminds me even of the idea of like the joy of the Lord is my strength there actually is like I, I'm, I'm wondering, I'm imagining um, joy, even sort of building some of these muscles in a, in a really cool way. Um, and thanks for the, like, uh, it's pretty powerful to, to hear you say that most of the calls to rejoice are calls to y'all. Um, and I think that that's actually like, that's actually a big deal. Um, and I was, as, as you were talking, I was thinking, okay, so like, what you're talking about feels very encouraging. And I'm thinking about my own team and I'm like, okay, I could, you know, at the, even at the top of staff meeting, we could do this like little thing um, where we, you know, have everybody pauses and just thinks about joy just as a way to sort of bring that to the surface. Um, you have an interesting line in your book though. And that is you say, oddly joy is another emotion that people often squelch. And so I'm thinking about both these things that we can do on purpose, this work we can do to posture ourselves for joy, but also like I'm, I'm, I find myself maybe nervous or worried, like, but what if I'm accidentally squelching joy in a bunch of other places? And so can you talk to us a bit more about what you mean by the fact that we squelch joy and how to be active in not being joy squelchers? Yeah. Um, I think Brene Brown is really helpful here. Brene says that joy is like the scariest emotion that we feel um, for many people. Um, and I, I do, I get that. Um, because the moment we feel it, we're afraid about the moment it's going to go away. Or the moment we feel it, we're concerned about the next, like the time when like, okay, because when we feel joy, we feel like, oh my goodness, I'm experiencing goodness. I'm experiencing connection to other people. I'm feeling like this sense of profound, like meaning in my life. Oh, I'm seeing the truth here. Like there's this, this beautiful thing. And so it's like, we just, we want to hold on to it forever. And we know that it's not going to be with us forever because it's a pretty ephemeral emotion. It actually comes in like, we experience happiness far more often than we experience joy generally. Um, and, um, and so I think we're just, it, it, we, we squelch it because we're afraid of like what it's going to feel like to, to like lose it or not have it, you know? Um, and so, and I think too, we squelch it because we're just, um, there's, there's a joy has a too muchness about it. And I think that many of us walk around very nervous to be too much, um, that we don't want to, we, you know, we don't want to be overly expressive, um, because we think, oh, you know, and then I think another thing is that we struggle. We think that, oh, I, if I share my joy with other people, um, like maybe, you know, so not only am I being too much maybe, but also as I share my joy with other people, like what if they're having a hard time or they're having it, you know, and they like, they don't, they don't want that right now in their lives, um, you know, or something like that. I think there's a lot of different reasons why we can squelch joy. 
it sounds like what you're saying now is that maybe it even goes back to the shame you were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. Like, do, are we are we ashamed of joy? Is that are you saying that? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I wow. think we um, because also joy makes us do like we kind of like we can get lost in it. Like when I say it's mm -hmm. too much, like I was just too muchness about it. Like we get, I mean, when we really give ourselves over to joy a lot of times there's like, we like have body movements, we're like ex really expressive. And we're just, you know, um, it can cause us to like cry a lot. It can, you know, at like there's like tears of joy. It can like overwhelm us in a way that we like feel like, oh man, I want to jump up and down or I'm like sitting down, you know? And I think we live, especially in the United States, many people who live here, like depending on the neighborhood, the context you grew up and everything like that, but we, we have struggle with like self-expression you know, and just like letting ourselves go. And um, because there is a lot of shame around every emotion. I mean, really like whether it's anger, crying, um, you know, fear or joy, like we struggle with expressing any of those emotions deeply, especially in public spaces. Yeah, I, and so one of the, I'm, I'm thinking again about like, okay, you know me I'm, I'm also a practical theologian and i'm like okay let's get the, i'm also like let's get going how do we how do we um, posture ourselves for more, for more joy and i think what i'm maybe picking out of what you're saying there is again like to deal with the fears that come with being an emotional being with being seen by other people um and you know angela i, I don't know how much I, I, if you're not totally equipped to talk about this, I don't want to, we can, you can take it in whatever way you want, but I'm like, you know, society as, as a whole, like, uh, does privilege some and alienate others and teaches some in the broadest, most general terms, we want to hear your voice and teaches others in the most broad general terms, like, please be quiet. And so like, how does, like social cultural location even play into this idea of getting more comfortable um, with joy. Yeah, I mean, I think that it just starts with, um, you know, I mean, I think that's why we start small, probably. We start with the team that we work with every week, or we start with our family. We start with our friend group that we meet with regularly, or our small group that we see or but you know, we start with, you know, what does it look like to authentically express whatever I'm feeling in my life um, with this group of people? What does it look like for this to be a space where people have permission to express like, you know, great joy or great sorrow or this or that? But again, it takes, I think, initially a leader who says, you know, so today we're gonna start staff meeting by like sharing laments. Like, what are you lamenting in your life? Like, what are you mourning anything that you would like to share today? And then just allowing that. And then you're just like, we're just going to let there be silence. Because that's the thing. If you're not even a Christian organization, you can still ask people, like, what are you lamenting? And then say, like, I'm going to, we're going to, like, give a couple minutes of silence to just, like, say, we recognize that there is lament in this space. And then another staff meeting, like, like, what has brought you joy in your work in the last six months? Like, can you think of a time when you experience like unspeakable joy at work? And then as you share that with each other, I mean, these are the sorts of things that I think really build those relationships over time on teams, um, in friend groups, in families and stuff like that, where you're teaching people, um, not only is like all of like who you are welcome here, but you're teaching people to pay attention to their emotions. Right. And then to express them when they come, you know, and that's the other thing is that we just don't, I don't remember, for example, like ever growing up, having people tell me when you're angry, this is how to be angry in constructive mm -hmm. way. Like, I don't like, it was always like, just don't be angry. <laughs> and I'm mm -hmm. like, well, that's not helpful. Like, what do I do when I'm really angry? And I was very angry after everyone died in four weeks. I was very, very angry. I walked around very angry and I had no idea what to do with my anger because the world was different and yet it wasn't. And it was just very, very frustrating to me. I walked around with a lot of fear of death and I didn't know like how to deal with it, you know, because we're not, you know, and then when, and then with joy, I think just there's something about learning to pay attention to how we feel, learning to pay attention and say like, where's the wisdom in this emotion? What is it teaching me 
about because that's the thing righteous anger is saying there's something that's not right that needs to be made right fear is saying like there's something that i am being like um that i need to pay attention to in my life and figure out and like work through you know what i mean like joy is saying hey like not everything like life is not all just brutal it's also amazing so um <laughs> you know because that's the thing life is brutal and amazing and um yeah because yeah and there's this this i'll just i'll end by saying this part like that there's a, i've been doing a meditation for the last almost year mm -hmm. every single morning it's like a nine minute meditation on the insight timer i love that little free app and one of the questions that she, the first question she asks every morning in this guided meditation is how does your heart feel mm -hmm. like how does your heart feel and it's it for the first few months it was very difficult for me to even be able to articulate to myself like this is this is how i feel um but learning to pay attention and then to work through those things to express them like these are all these are things that make us more human um i i love that i i when you said that i was like gosh like how easy would it be for me to like describe how my heart feels like how close is that information or would i have to go work for it um you've talked a couple different times um and we're probably like nearing the end of our time. So if you have a burning question that you haven't asked somebody, go ahead and ask it. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask my question. Um, you talked a few different times about like the fear of anger. And right there, you said like, I didn't know like how to be angry. It feels like a, in many moments, a critical first thing to be able to get through. So like, how did you learn to deal with that, all that anger? Um, I... You know, I think that for me, it really was therapy. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, you know, I think that like, and that's, that's what's sad to me though, is that like most of us have to pay for people mm -hmm. to help us like manage our feelings and like, like in constructive ways. And mm -hmm. it's like, it would be nice if there were, cause not everyone has the ability to pay for therapy. You know, I wish everybody did, but it can be pretty expensive to work through your feelings in therapy. <laughs> So for me, I had like the means to have a therapist. And I think that that's where I began to really, you know, but also it was in that prison room, in that prison Bible study where these women like would express like that they were angry at times. Like I'm angry that I can't be with my children. I'm angry mm -hmm. that this is, that I've like grown up in this situation. I'm angry that I was sexually abused. I was, I'm angry about this or that. And it was like, the more I say in, in the gravity of joy that like nothing was half baked in prison. That's why I felt so alive there. Mm -hmm. And so I think that there was something about that space also that taught me that the more like that if I just said it, like that was the first step of working through it was like just owning like this is this is how it is, you know, mm -hmm. that was the first constructive step. step. But um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's some great um, people are dialoguing with you as you talk. Um, just the idea that like, you know, fear can make us panic and fear uh, makes us think that we like have to act or not act. We have to sort of decide right away um, and that they're, you're talking about more of a holding space. Um, Angela, I like it's so fun to hear you unpack all of this. Um, I like I feel motivated just in my own leadership to make some space for this kind of stuff um, and not just for me but for the y'all um, obviously we're all living and moving in different contexts but um, I'm like yeah I want to like you know and somebody else put in the chat earlier that the way you're talking about joy feels like it um, you know fits really fits with hope um, it really and so it's like okay what are what have we lamented about where have we felt joy and what might we be hoping for feels like this go ahead so Jürgen Moltmann the German theologian says that hope is the anticipation of joy. Mm. Mm. So I think, you know, so yeah, hope is also a gateway to joy because mm. like, and so joy is like Aquinas says that joy is the ultimate positive emotion that every positive emotion really is caught up in joy. And I love mm. that image. And, um, but I love the idea that, so like the moment that like really like a major way of posturing ourselves for joy is to have hope that it will mm. find us, you know? Mm. Yeah, to have hope that it will find us, that's good. Um, I wanna ask you one more brief question before we close, and this comes from someone in the Q&A. Like, okay, this, sound, uh, this sounds great. Um, I'm really, you know, I'm putting words down in this person's mouth. Like, this feels like it requires a lot of bravery, right? In some ways. 
Like, what do you do when you feel like others are devaluing or discounting those feelings? Like you're doing the work to show up honestly, but you're not being met. What do you do then? Uh, find other people to <laughs> <laughs> find different people to share your life. You know, and I'm serious because um, I, I have like, if there's anything I've learned in the last four and a half years, like, or four years since all of this happened, it's that like, it is um, like, it's essential to find those people that you can be your authentic self with. And um, for me, like, I didn't find it in the church that I was attending in New Haven. Um, I didn't find it either church, to be honest, you know, but then I went and hung out at this prison Bible study with these women. I found it. Um, I, I had trouble finding it among like certain, a lot of friends in New Haven. And so, um, for me, it was like, you know, calling people like you, Michaela and saying, Michaela is someone who can hold space with me for how I'm feeling. And so I'm going to seek her out, but that it takes bravery, right? It takes courage. Mm -hmm. So for us to find people that we can be authentically ourselves with and share what we're feeling with, um, even our joy too, right? You, we have to like, but our group, like we have a, we have a group of friends where mm -hmm. we really have worked hard to celebrate with each other, to rejoice with each other on a regular basis so that our group has become a place, a friend, of, like a group of friends where we know when I have something to celebrate, I can share it with you like, and with Lindsay and with Beth and, you know, like we're, and with Liz, like we're going to share our joys with each other because they're going to be received in this place. So I think it's about finding, like being brave and saying, I'm going to find people that I can authentically be myself with. Um, and sometimes it's in unexpected places like prison Bible studies. So I encourage you, um, I think volunteerism, like, especially like, you know, being with people who, um, I don't know, I, I like, spending time in a prison changed everything about how I see the world and how I see faith and doubt and everything. It, it radically shaped me forever. So I encourage people to be pen pals with people who are incarcerated, um, to mm -hmm. volunteer in a prison, teach a hobby in a prison, teach a Bible study in a prison or something, or an ICE detention center. Like I have one 25 minutes from my house, uh, be a chaplain there, um, you know, volunteer your time um, with like foster care kids or like big brothers, big sisters, those sorts of things. These are the things that um, you'll find. Yeah, I think that will that will uh, will allow you to allow God, like allow joy to find you in a way that you never expected. By yeah, those sorts of things. That's really beautiful. Um, my great prayer and hope is that so many people are writing you and the the pre center in the coming weeks and months, and they're like, whoa, I like started to notice like joy whoa I started to do this thing different with my team whoa I do feel my posture shift um, so thank you for the food for thought uh, we'll send out an email that has a link both to Angela's book and also there's a devotional resource we just put out by an, uh, Inez Velasquez McBride called Finding God Hope is a Habit that Grows in the Dark and her themes are like really like it just feels like it really goes so we're going to send you a link to that too um, but thank you all so much for being with us. Angela, thank you. Thank you for your time, for your wisdom. It feels hard won. So thanks for sharing it with us. Mm, thank you for having me. It, yeah, thank you. Yeah. All right. Bye, everybody.